Imagine waking up one morning and bam, there it is, 10 million Egyptian pounds just sitting in your account. Wow. Just like that. That's a lot of money. Sounds pretty amazing, right? But hold on. What if it wasn't just you? What if every single person in Egypt woke up to the same surprise windfall? Okay, I'm intrigued. Today we're diving into a fascinating thought experiment, exploring what could happen if that actually happened. It's like a real-life economic simulation almost. Yeah, exactly. Our source material this time is actually a conversation that someone had with ChatGPT, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Where they actually proposed this idea of just giving every single person in Egypt 10 million EGP. Just like a giant giveaway. Yeah, and ChatGPT actually ran some simulations to try to analyze what that would do to Egypt's economy. That's wild. So before we get into that, though, I think it's important to understand the context, right? Egypt's facing some serious economic challenges right now. Oh, absolutely, yeah. One of the biggest ones being access to U.S. dollars. Yeah, that's huge. Because Egypt needs those dollars to import all sorts of essential goods, right? Everything, pretty much, yeah. Everything from food to, you know, raw materials for businesses. Yeah, think of, like, the components they need to manufacture products or even finished goods they sell directly. But those dollars, they're in really short supply, which is a problem for businesses trying to you know, buy anything from other countries. It is. It creates this huge obstacle, you know, getting their hands on the dollars they need to do business. And that scarcity of dollars has created this whole other market, the black market. Oh, right. The shadow economy. Yeah, where importers are so desperate to get these dollars that they're willing to pay way more for them. Yeah, they're operating outside the official system, dealing with fluctuating prices, trying to get the dollars they need. Some estimates say that up to 80% of importers in Egypt are relying on this unofficial system to get the dollars they need. 80%, that's massive. I know, it's crazy. But I'm thinking about the average person on the street. Like, how does all this impact them? That's a really good question because ultimately this all trickles down to the cost of, well, everything. It makes sense. When importers have to pay more for dollars on the black market, they're going to pass those costs on, right? They have to. And that means that prices for everything, your groceries, your clothes, even basic necessities start to go up. Which leads to inflation, right? Exactly, inflation. It hurts everyone's wallets, especially those who can least afford it. So essentially, this shortage of dollars is having a ripple effect throughout the entire economy. Absolutely. And that brings us back to this radical solution that was brought up in this chat GPT conversation. Okay, let's hear it. What if we just print a trillion EGP? It's trillion with a T. Okay. And just give every single person in Egypt 10 million EGP. Whoa, that's quite the cash infusion. It is. It's huge. The reasoning behind this is essentially to just jumpstart the economy. I see. If everyone suddenly has all this money to spend. More purchasing power, more spending. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Then, in theory, that should stimulate businesses and kickstart economic growth. And this is a one-time thing. One-time thing. Yeah, not like they're going to be getting 10 million every month or anything like that. Okay, so it's like a one-time economic booster shot. I like that. That's a good way to put it. I'm curious about what ChatGPT had to say about this, though. I mean, I imagine there are downsides. Oh, yeah, for sure. And ChatGPT's simulations definitely highlighted some potential downsides. The biggest one, and probably the most obvious one, is hyperinflation. Right. If everyone's got millions to spend all of a sudden, wouldn't prices just skyrocket? Exactly. And if prices rise faster than people's incomes, then the money starts to lose its value. Right. It's that classic loaf of bread scenario, right? Yeah. What costs a dollar today might cost five dollars tomorrow. Exactly. It's really hard to keep up and it makes it harder and harder for people to afford basic things. But the person in the conversation pointed out some interesting things about the simulations, like maybe there were some missing pieces. Oh, OK. Like what? Well, for example, they pointed out that spending wouldn't just increase forever. Right. People adjust. It would be more of a short-term spike and then kind of level off as people adjust it. Yeah, it's not like everyone would instantly develop these extravagant spending habits. Exactly, exactly. And then there's that whole black market dynamic to consider, right? Right. 80% of importers are already outside that official system. So their argument was maybe this cash injection wouldn't actually impact the official exchange rate that much. Because they're already playing by a different set of rules. Exactly. Interesting. And they also brought up another really thought-provoking point. What's that? What if the government used this as an opportunity to try and incentivize local production? Okay, how would they do that? Well, for example, they could remove taxes on raw materials. Makes them cheaper to produce. Exactly. 
So then certainly locally made products become way more affordable. That's smart. So people would be more likely to spend their newfound riches on locally produced goods. Hmm. Yeah. And that could create kind of a positive feedback loop, right? Yeah. Boost local demand, increase local production, and hopefully reduce their reliance on those U.S. dollars. Exactly. Okay. I'm starting to see how this could potentially work. Yeah. And there's one more interesting layer to this whole thing. Okay. Lay it on me. Think about all those importers sitting on piles and piles of Egyptian pounds. Right. But they can't easily use that money to buy U.S. dollars. Right. So what are they going to do with all that money? That's the question. They can't just hoard it forever. They might start looking for other ways to invest that money. Right? Okay. Like where? Well, within Egypt itself. Interesting. Instead of trying to convert it all into U.S. dollars, they might start investing in local businesses or real estate. So they're essentially forced to invest in the country's economy. Exactly. That's a fascinating unintended consequence. It is. And that could actually lead to a surge in domestic investment, which could further boost the economy. Wow. So we've got this potential chain reaction happening. Right. right. Increased spending, more local production, potentially shifting toward exports, even a stronger Egyptian pound. It's pretty fascinating. It really is. But what happens next? Did ChatGPT look at what happens long term? They did. They actually made a five-year projection to see how this might all play out over time. Okay, now we're talking. So in the next part, we're going to go on a five-year journey through this hypothetical scenario. Exactly. We're going to see what happens, you know, if this really did happen. I can't wait. Stay tuned because it gets really interesting. I'm hooked. Okay, so we've got this crazy scenario, right? What if everyone in Egypt suddenly got 10 million EGP? And we're looking at what ChatGPT thinks could happen. Right. We're about to go on a five-year journey through this economic thought experiment. A five-year projection, like a glimpse into a possible future. Exactly. And ChatGPT broke it down into different stages, you know, how things might unfold over time. Okay. So let's start with those first couple of years after everyone gets this massive windfall. All right. Years one and two. What happens? Well, those are going to be the, uh, I guess you could call them the hold on tight years. Oh, why is that? Because there's bound to be some, you know, some turbulence. Because of inflation. Exactly. Yeah. Think about it. Suddenly everyone has all this extra money to spend. So demand for everything is going to skyrocket. Right. That makes sense. Which puts upward pressure on prices. So we're probably going to see some, you know, some significant price increases, especially in those first couple of years. So how do we keep things from, you know, completely spiraling out of control? Well, remember those tax breaks on raw materials we talked about? Oh, yeah. That's going to be crucial here. Okay. By making it cheaper to produce goods locally, the government can help businesses ramp up production, you know, increase supply to try and keep pace with that increased demand. So it's all about trying to find that balance, right? Exactly. Balance the increased demand with, hopefully, an increase in supply to try and, you know, keep those price hikes in check. I mean, even with all that, it seems like some price increases are probably inevitable. Yeah, probably to some extent. Are there any other things that the government could do to kind of smooth things out? Oh, yeah, for sure. They could implement some targeted subsidies, you know, for essential goods. Oh, okay. Or even temporarily control prices on certain things to prevent them from, you know, just skyrocketing. So it's not just about letting the free market run wild. There's a role for some, you know, strategic government intervention. Exactly. It's about trying to create the right conditions for the economy to adjust to this massive influx of cash. All right. So we've made it through those first couple of years. The economy's, you know, starting to stabilize. Right. We've weathered the storm. What happens next? Well, as we move into years three and four, things start to settle down a bit. Okay. And we start to see some of the, uh, you know, the potential long-term benefits of this whole thing start to emerge. So this is the calm after the storm phase. Yeah, you could say that. By mm. this point, local production should have expanded significantly. Okay. We're talking more businesses, more factories, and crucially, more jobs being created. So all that initial spending starts to translate into real economic growth. Yeah, exactly. But ultimately, the goal is to solve that dollar shortage problem. Right, right. reduce their dependence on imports. So how does all this increased local production help with that? Well, here's where things get really interesting. Okay, I'm listening. As these local businesses grow and become more sophisticated, they're going to start looking beyond Egypt's borders. Okay. They're going to start exploring opportunities to export their goods to other countries. 
So instead of relying so heavily on imports, Egypt could actually become a supplier to the world. Exactly. Right. And when they export their products, they bring in foreign currency, you know, U.S. dollars. So we're starting to chip away at that dollar shortage problem, but from a different angle. Precisely. And as those exports grow, you're creating this new source of U.S. dollars, which could help, you know, stabilize the Egyptian pound. Right. It's a virtuous cycle. Okay. So we've got increased domestic spending, more local production, a shift towards exports, and hopefully mm -hmm. a stronger Egyptian pound. It's all starting to come together. But there's one more year in this five-year projection, right? What happens in year five? Year five is when things could get really exciting. This is where we see the potential for, you know, a real transformation of Egypt's economy. Okay, I can't wait to hear this. What does Egypt look like in year five? Well, imagine this. Egypt's not just meeting its own needs. It's become a real hub of export activity. Okay. A country with a diversified economy, you know, a skilled workforce, businesses that are competitive on a global scale. That's a pretty amazing vision. It is, but it's uh -huh. important to remember this is all hypothetical. Right. This is all based on a simulation. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that could affect whether this would actually work in the real world. So what are some of those key factors that would determine if this could really succeed? Well, one of the most important things is going to be strong government support for those domestic industries. We've talked about tax breaks and subsidies, but it sounds like it goes way beyond that. It does, yeah. yeah. You need to create a real business-friendly environment, you know, streamline regulations, encourage investment, entrepreneurship. So it's not just about throwing money at the problem. It's about creating the right conditions for businesses to really thrive. Exactly. What about all that extra money that's floating around? Yeah, that's another big one. People need to invest it wisely. Absolutely. If everyone just goes on a spending spree buying up imported luxury goods. Yeah, that defeats the purpose. It does. It completely undermines the whole thing. They need to channel that money into productive investments. Investments that contribute to long-term growth. Exactly. Things like building new factories, investing in research and development, expanding existing businesses. And of course, we can't forget about the exchange rate. Right. Oh, right. that's going to be crucial throughout this whole process. How do you manage that? Well, you need policies in place that help stabilize the Egyptian pound, make sure that it stays competitive. So the central bank will need to play a role. Yeah, they'll definitely need to intervene carefully to make sure things don't get out of hand. But the key is to create a stable, predictable environment for businesses. Okay, so we've got all these potential benefits. We've got the potential pitfalls. We've got all these factors that could determine success or failure. Right. What's the final verdict? I mean, could this actually work? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Honestly, I don't think there's an easy answer. I figure as much. There are so many variables, and predicting the future is, well, it's impossible. But it sure is fun to think about. Oh, absolutely. That's what makes it so interesting. It's like we've been on this incredible journey, you know, exploring this hypothetical world. Exactly. And even though we can't say for sure whether any of this would actually happen, it's given us a lot to think about. It really has. It makes you realize how complex these systems are. It's a reminder that even the most unconventional ideas, you know, they can lead to some really insightful conversations. And they challenge us to look at things in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to keep doing in part three of our deep dive. Yeah. So we've been talking about this pretty wild thought experiment. Yeah. You know, what if everyone in Egypt suddenly got 10 million EGP? Yeah, it's a fascinating idea, right? But... As with any simulation, it's important to remember that real life is so much more complex. Oh, absolutely. I mean, ChatGPT gave us some potential outcomes, but there's just so many things that could happen that would completely throw those predictions off track. You're right. Like, we can't ignore what's happening in the rest of the world. Yeah, Egypt's not an island. Exactly. Things like, I don't know, a global recession or a sudden surge in oil prices. Those kinds of external shocks could really impact things. And even within Egypt itself, I mean, we've been focused on economics, but there's so much more to consider. Oh, absolutely. The social and political landscape plays a huge role. What about things like political stability or corruption or social inequality? Exactly. All of those factors could influence how this whole scenario would play out in reality. It's like economics isn't just about numbers on a spreadsheet. Right. It's about people. It's about how they behave, their motivations, all those messy, unpredictable things that make up human societies. And that's what makes it so interesting to study, right? It's this complex puzzle with all these interconnected pieces. Well, this whole deep dive started with this what if question, right? What if everyone in Egypt got this sudden windfall? Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, what 
other radical ideas are out there? Like, what other what-ifs could really shake things up and change how we think about economics? Oh, there are so many. I mean, what if we completely rethought how we measure economic progress? Okay, like, what do you mean by that? Instead of just focusing on GDP, what if we started looking at things like well-being or environmental sustainability or social justice? That would be a pretty big shift. It would. It's oh. like challenging those old assumptions and mm. looking for new ways to create a more just and sustainable world. And I think that's what makes economics so exciting. You know, it's not some static field. Right. It's constantly evolving. And who knows, maybe one of these seemingly outlandish ideas could actually hold the key to solving some of the world's biggest problems. Well, on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. Yeah, it's been a fascinating conversation. Before we go, do you have any recommendations for our listeners who, you know, maybe want to keep exploring some of these ideas? Absolutely. If you're interested in learning more about Egypt's economic situation, I always recommend checking out publications like the Financial Times or the World Bank's reports. They provide really in-depth analysis and data. And for those who want to, you know, really dive into economic theory and explore some of those alternative models we were talking about, there are some fantastic books out there. Oh, for sure. A great place to start would be Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. It really challenges that traditional, you know, growth-centric model of economics and proposes a new framework for a more sustainable and equitable economy. And Freakonomics is always a fun read, very accessible for anyone who wants to see how economics can be applied to everyday life. It's a classic. So to all our listeners out there, keep asking those what-if questions, keep challenging those assumptions, and keep diving deep into the fascinating world of economics. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone, to Stuff Africa.